designed to kind of get an idea of what it was like growing up in Corona, hence the title of our event here. Um, about their families, about growing up, about school, about culture. So what we're going to do is just ask them, ask a question, and the panel is going to go down the line and answer that question. So it should be fun, it should be interesting. Um, fortunately, we're videotaping, so uh, we're going to have uh, the ability to put this on the web for everybody to see forever and ever and ever, so that's awesome. I'm excited about that. Um, and then depending on, uh, uh, on time, we're just going to go a little bit after 11 o'clock, so we have about an hour here, but depending on time, we have a little trivia between the audience. We're going to pit the audience against the panel, so we'll see how that goes. All right, we all ready? All right. So first question, and Mike's going to start. What year did your family move to Corona, and what brought them here? Well, the Mejias and the Ramirez's came to Corona between 1910 and 1920 when there was uh, the Mexican Revolution, so they moved to the United States to avoid getting hurt. And my father was born in 1924, my mother in 1927, and from those, the union of those two came four sons, and I'm one of them. My brother Art is here. I have a brother named Dave and Richard. My parents went to this school, graduated 43 and 46. No, I'm sorry, 43 and 45. And then they started a business here at Corona in 1956. And my brother and I just uh, retired about two years ago. Um, that's pretty much it for right now on that first question. That's a tough one. Oh, one more thing, I'm sorry. Um, my mother's last name was Ramirez. and. Uh, her brother, which I think some of you may remember, was Augie Ramirez, who was my high school vice principal, and then he ended up being the superintendent of schools here in the uh, late 70s and the early 80s. My family, first of all, I'm Jim Steele. Actually, that's not important. Um, <laughs> my family moved here in 1965, and uh, I, I just, we moved from L.A. area, and I had just finished my sophomore year, and I moved out here. And I was talking with Coach Wilkerson about this just a little while ago. Uh, I played football down through since I was in fifth grade, Pop Warner and all that business, and so when I moved out here, it's a whole new ball game, and actually, I found a, a lot better talent out here than what I've been playing with. So I didn't—I wasn't near as good as I thought I was. <laughs> um, and and then talking about this, I, I was reflecting back on that's one of those big words I kind of learned. But anyway, um, like one, the best athlete during our era in high school was a fellow named Jerry McDaniel. Um, and probably the majority of you all know him, coach coach with him for 20 years after high school, and Jerry later became a CHP. But anyway, Jerry was just a phenomenal ball player, athlete for that, that era. Um, I'm kind of getting off the track. But anyway, so it was just uh, such a change for me moving out here after we'd lived down there all, all my life. So now we're out here, and um, I remember this was interesting. We drove, I had to take my brother's to uh, Norco to register for school one afternoon, and um, I had never been around uh, cows and things of this nature, and, th and they went to Norco, and so I remember we came to a stop at a stop sign, I look over, and there's a cow tied up to a mailbox, <laughs> and I'm thinking, what did my parents do to me? They have moved me to the wilderness, and, and so then, all of that experience, though, as I look back on it, was probably one of the better things that had happened to me in my young life, was moving out to this area. Um, and then they had a thing called an ice cream social that summer at the high school. Now, coming from where I came from, there was no such thing. Uh, well, there's different reasons why that would occur. But anyway, um, and I got to meet the different people out here, and it was just a whole different lifestyle. Uh, the Corona and Norco area was a far more slower environment than where I came from. I have a lot nicer. So, how am I doing on time? Great. You've got two minutes. Nice. Um, 
so then during this era, after we started um, the high school, we were talking about um, uh, that first football season that, I, that was going on out here. And Coach Jim Thompson was our football coach at the time. And our first game was against, our first um, preseason game was against Lakewood High School. It was a bad memory, to be honest with you. Um, I think the score was like 41 to nothing, things along those lines. Um, and for whatever reason, Coach Thompson kind of thought that that was the way to go with scheduling games because the next year, our opening game was against St. Paul, who later went on to win the CIF uh, uh, 5A championship. And uh, they just annihilated us. But anyway, with all that said, that's probably pretty much the end of my statement. You guys have a great afternoon. <laughs>
uh, overnight, literally Standard Oil had our well rights, and uh, in January of 57, they discovered how cheap foreign oil was. Overnight, they capped all of our producing wells. So if you were in oil, you were unemployed, we were done. So uh, we, we all truck our house, our car, boat, all the toys and trinkets. Called a friend, Dick Hobbs, Richard and Millie Hobbs, uh, had moved out from uh, Black Hills to Corona. We called them January 3rd, I think it was. Dick, what's the temperature out where you are in Corona? He said, well, 78. I looked at the thermometer, it was 22 below. <laughs> I said, we'll see you Friday. That's literally what we did. We packed up. We came out in a 1953 station wagon with a few possessions, a 1936 Chevrolet pickup truck, like the Oklahoma Sooners, with a Masonite homemade camper shell on it. That's how we came out. We started out with nothing. And here I am, 60 years later, have most of it left. So it has been a good transition, though. Our town was like 3,500 people where we came from. I came to Corona, I was overwhelmed. Number one, the traffic. We could drive for five hours at night back there with the headlights on bright and never get near the dimmer switch. Out here, good luck putting your headlights on bright. You can't do it. <laughs> then we came to Corona, which seemed like a huge town, but it was really small then. I discovered there were more Mejias in Corona than the state I came from. <laughs> I thought, this is, this is a big deal. I love coming out here. The climate change was awesome. I'd never seen a palm tree. I saw these tall, these hundred foot palms. I was just amazed. The smell, the one smell I, I don't like with so much around is geraniums. Well, that's a nasty smell. I think they're pretty. And uh, I just still, I remember my first smell in front of was a geranium next to a palm tree. It was, it was a neat experience coming out though. Everybody talked fast like I do now. But when I came out here from Wyoming, I talked slow. It was sad. It was a come on. Pick it up. Pick it up. We made our first trip uh, out of Corona and we got brave. My mom had no sense of directions. She got on Grand Boulevard. <laughs> you know where this is going. We are going to go to the ocean at Long Beach. We never got out of town. So she was love St. Edward's Church. She said, there's so many of those beautiful churches on the street. It was, it was an experience. I'm Alicia Ramos Black, and when I read these questions, my father at age 11, my, my father and his parents were all born in Mexico, but my grandfather came here first and worked in the citrus uh, industry, and my, grand, or my father and my grandmother met him in Yuma, Arizona, and they were there for a year, and then at age 11, my dad drove with his parents, and he literally drove the, the, the team, the car, at 11 years old to get here to Corona. So yeah, I was just to brag about that. And my first grandson just got his license at 16. I think you're kind of old. <laughs> but anyway, my dad came here, and when he was a kid, he had injured an arm. So that kept him out of military service and all kinds of things. And he was lucky. I think the man's name was King. That there was a, a teacher at um, Corona Junior High, which is now Corona Fun Fundamental, that taught him photography. And then he also learned more photography from the people that ran the Mission Inn um, photo studio. So my dad, if any of you went to school here in Corona, my dad probably took your picture. Okay, well, everybody went through, through uh, school here, he took your picture at one time or another. He started photography at age nine. He started taking wet, not nine, he was in ninth grade. He started taking pictures. My, so my dad was here in 1930 with his family. My mother grew up in the Claremont Laverne area, and her father had been from the same town that my dad's parents were from. And they all ended up here in, in California, so they were real close to each other. My grandfather on my mom's side used to train racehorses. So my mom used to be able to remember where the ranch was that she uh, grew up on, but now it was on Foothill Boulevard. Now she can't tell because it's changed so much. But like I say, my parents came here in, well, my grandfather in 1930, and my mom not talked until she got married, which is probably 42 or 43. Hi, I moved here with my folks in 1954, and I was 10 years old, but I'm not going to tell you how old I am now. Uh, <laughs> But I really, really love this town when we moved here because we came from Brawley. I was born at Brawley and we worked in all the crops and stuff there. So when we moved here, it was a lot cooler. 
and everybody was so friendly. It was like 12,000 people, and everybody knew everybody, you know? And even today, as big as Corona is, is, you still have these same people you run into, you say hi and talk to. So it's still basically a small town, even though it's a big town, which I'm happy about. I met my husband here, and we were married here, and very happy, and my son went to the same schools I went to, and my granddaughter went to the same schools I went to, so I guess we're here forever. <laughs> but I love the town, and high school I loved. We were the class that moved in the middle of the year, and I really, really, none of us I don't think really wanted to leave this school and not graduate from this one because we fell in love with it so much, but we were the first ones to graduate from the new school on 10th Street in 61. But I still have a lot of contact. I'm planning my 55th class reunion right now with a bunch of nice people that we keep in contact with, and that's why I say it's just still a small town and everybody wants to be together. And I'm glad I'm here. All right, well, thank you very much. That's how, kind of how we're going to do it. I'm just going to read the question once, and we'll go down. If anybody wants me to repeat the question, just raise your hand, and I will. Um, and please thank you for not holding the resentments against the person with the, the uh, clock on you. But uh, we do have a lot of questions to ask, and we want to try to get through them, so thank you. Uh, question number two, what elementary school did you attend and describe one of your fondest memories of those years? Could you repeat that question? <laughs> <laughs> My brothers and I went to uh, Lincoln School, which is still here. It's over on Fullerton Avenue. I started there in 1955 to 1962. And my fondest memory uh, that, that really sticks out in my mind is when I was in fourth grade, uh, we used to play a lot of softball at, during recess. and. My fourth grade class beat my brother's sixth grade class, and that was, you know, really neat. And at that time, it came into my head, you know, when I get to high school, we're going to have some really good teams because we, we were only fourth graders, we're beating sixth graders. Well, when I got to high school, we were first place in football, wrestling, and baseball. We were league champions. Wow. So, um, it came true. Yeah. Anyway, um... <laughs> Those were, that was one of my biggest memories of being in elementary school. I mentioned that I went to Lincoln. I did, okay. First of all, I, I didn't go to grade school a lot here at all. But, and what I have since learned is I probably didn't really like people who went to Lincoln. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. That was great. Um, so really, I don't have anything that would be really relevant to this, this question regarding that, other than uh, uh, Mike. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass this on to Joanne for this question. Okay, you all know that I went to Eastvale. <laughs> um, and Eastvale, it was a newly built school. And uh, they were on Sumner in a little three-room school. And so, um, um, it, it was different. I came in um, my sixth, uh, sixth grade uh, in January. And, um, it, you know, the school was just, uh, uh, it was really little. But I just, I don't know, I just had fun. I just had fun in all of uh, the grade school and in high school. Yeah. Did you guys bring the chalk your No. <laughs> oh. When we came out to uh, Corona, we lived on Coda Street between Railroad and River Road. The only house on Coda Street, still the only house on Coda Street, uh, on top of the hill. So since we were outside, the city limits were county, they said even though you're literally, I can look down the hill and see the high school, you have to go to Norco Schools. So they sent us off to Sierra Vista, which is neat. My first memory of Sierra Vista was the principal, Mildred Whiteside Fluch, who was probably 19 feet tall. She <laughs> terrified me. She had the white hair. She was turned up to be a great lady. I was a young kid. She just, I was 
intimidated me. Even but the rascal. neat thing about Sierra Vista that I remember mostly was on Fridays, we had our open assemblies out in front of the school. They would have our little home-built band, we would do patriotic-type songs, we would sing neat stuff. It was just rural Americana back then, and every day, every week, we look forward to those Friday assemblies. Monty Montana came out to do a little dog and pony show one time. That was neat. Um, Sierra Vista was cool. Mr. Farmer, everybody knows Mr. Farmer. The greatest thing ever happened to me at Sierra Vista is I got stuck in chorus. I sing like a bullfrog. And one day, Mr. Farmer was having us all sing a C. He said, somebody here needs to die. He went down the line. <laughs> I knew it was going to be. He came to me, asked me to hold a C. He threw me out. He said, Mr. Pixley, leave. Never darken this doorway again. He 86 me, but I love him the rest of his life. <laughs> all right, thank you. Next question, another childhood question. What was your most beloved toy? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I don't think I do. Describe it and what feelings, before you get into it, give us your feelings about how you felt about that toy, Mike. <laughs> I didn't have a toy that I just, oh God, I love this toy, I love it. I can't wait for tomorrow to play with it. What I enjoyed growing up was when I would get sporting goods, yes. baseball gloves, bats, footballs. I mean, that, that was what, one of the things I loved. And then you'd get something new, you'd go out in your street in front of your house. Mm -hmm. You could actually play in the street without getting run over. I mean, every once in a while a car would drive by, but you know, you just move out of the way and then you go back to Flint Street. The only thing we worry about is breaking somebody's window, which I did on many occasions. If somebody's window got broken, I did it. <laughs> Reflecting back on the question about toys and things of that nature, um, it seems like, first of all, a bicycle was a big one for me back in 12, whatever, because that also gave me uh, the ability to have my paper route, which was pretty much my lifeblood at that time. And, uh, and then also, as when we were younger, uh, you get your toy guns. And so my brothers and I were always trying to shoot each other. Um, and so that's probably why everyone thinks that uh, we all have hostile natures today. <laughs> um, what was, there was something, oh, boxing gloves was big in, in our family. We had three boys, and that's pretty much the way everything got settled. Uh, now, I'm not really sure that was a good memory. It did help me take care of some of those baby teeth that would get in the way. Because a strong right hand to the head would usually do it. Uh, but, but there again, like Mike was talking, uh, sporting items, baseball gloves. I can still remember going to a, a sporting goods store and you'd smell the leather of the new ba baseball gloves. And, and, and someone had mentioned uh, smells earlier, and that's one that always stands out in my mind. Um, but that's pretty much it. So with that, um, you're up, Joanne. Um, actually, I didn't have any toys. On the farm, um, we had three families, my, uh, and, and uh, uh, with my um, cousin, he's about the same age as I, I was, and he was the, the organizer. There were so many of us that we, we could, you know, play baseball or, you know, do something, you know, um, outside. But uh, as far as uh, toys, no, I don't, uh, we never, I never had toys, I never had dolls, you know, or, or anything like that, so. I didn't have any dolls either. <laughs> <laughs> like suspect that answer. I love Jimmy, he can lie with such a straight face. <laughs> but my, my favorite toy is a simple thing, is a little plastic extruded, molded, like a mountain game. It was, it was made by Happy Hour Toys back in the Mideast, or Midwest rather, and it's a, a mountain range with marbles and little steps. You roll dice, you progress along these ridges, and the marble will get trapped in quicksand pits. I love that game. They're highly collectible. I, I found two over the last 10 years on eBay. Both Cherry bought one for me and one for my sister. She loved the game, so that was my favorite. I would not let my own children play it because 
they're heathens and they would step on it and break it. <laughs> so that was it. And uh, Jimmy mentioned boxing gloves. My dad bought a pair of boxing gloves. My sister and I were supposed to settle disputes with boxing gloves. My sister, some of you might remember her, Davida, was a year ahead of me in school. She was a wild woman, athletic, and she would put on those boxing gloves and she would clean my clock. <laughs> I like the happy hour toys. When I read this question, the one toy that kept sticking in my mind was the old roller skates that were metal. Oh, yeah. And you had to have a key to adjust them. And they had to go on your shoes, so you had to make sure that you had shoes with a lip on them that that could adjust to. And I don't know how, how many of you remember, but we used to have a skating ring in town. It's, it's a building that's across from the Central America on 6th Street that's now, I think, belongs to Riverside Community College. But that's where the skating ring was. And it went from a skating ring to a furniture store. It was Keller Furniture Store. And, and I don't know, oh, it was a fabric store at one time. And now it's, it's uh, business offices for the college. When Jim Steele mentioned his bicycle, it brought a memory to my mind that I'd forgotten all about. When I got my first three-speed, because there were not ten-speed bicycles, it was a Sunday morning, and this boy that I had a crush on, in fact, his daughter and my daughter are good friends now, Paul was going to church, and I had this new bike, and he goes, oh, that's a beautiful bike, can you ride it? Sure I can, Paul, I'll show you when you come back from church. I didn't know how to ride it, and I didn't know how to stop it. <laughs> so when he came back from through, through our neighborhood to say hi to me again, he says, okay, I want to watch you ride. Well, I got on the bike trying to show off, and I took off, and then I couldn't figure out how to stop it, so I had to get a curb stop. <laughs> and he came over to me and says, have you ever ridden this before? I go, no. <laughs> well, I never got a bike, but my brother did for Christmas, so I rode it one day, and he caught, came home and caught me, so then I had to pump him around four blocks. I never took it out again without asking. My biggest and most important toy I ever received was when my mother made Raggedy Ann dolls for us with long hair. And I'll never forget that. Every Christmas that's what we got for a doll and it was just beautiful. But uh, I could have thought of a bunch of other things I'd like to have. A fishing pole or some fly, stuff for fly fishing and all that. And my dad used to get us fishing poles because we went fishing practically every weekend. So. I had fun. Anyway, thank you.